And if you can uh, turn with me, let's open up as we make our way through the book of Revelation. So Revelation 16, verse 1. The title of our message is, His Judgment is Coming. His Judgment is Coming. Years ago, when we first started the church, um, some 18 years ago or so, back at the women's club, it was a, really a blessed time, but there's something I would deal with quite often was migraine headaches, and uh, sometimes I would have them you know, for days on end, and it was terrible, and it wasn't a fun season. Uh, we had many people praying, and I mean, I'd literally go to the, sometimes the pain was so bad, go to the hospital, and they'd say, well, what... You know, between one to ten, what number would you say you're at? And I would, with all sincerity, say a 14, because it was just beyond uh, control. You couldn't even fathom. It was just terrible. But thank you, Lord. That doesn't happen very often, and I'm so blessed that the prayers have, you know, have worked and all. But have you ever been so sick that you're, you're sick and you're thinking, okay, this has to be the end of it because it can't get any worse? You ever get to that place? And then, and then the next day it gets worse. In our text, what will happen during the time of tribulation, as we're looking at these seven bull judgments, I believe when it gets to the place with the trumpet judgments that we looked at, it's going to be so severe during the trumpet judgments that people are going to say, it can't get any worse than this. But we're going to read, it does get worse. Chapter 16 in the book of Revelation here is probably the darkest chapter in the book of Revelation, probably one of the darkest chapters in the entire Bible. This earth it will experience the wrath of God poured out on a Christ-rejected world. God hates sin. God is a good judge, deals with sin. He punishes sin. And either your sin has been dealt with at the cross of Calvary on Jesus Christ Therefore, the wrath of God has been poured out on Jesus. Or if you do not accept the free gift, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you, God's wrath will be poured on you personally. That's what we're reading here. God's wrath poured out on a Christ-rejected world. Those that rebel and rebel after warning, after warning, after warning, and they still keep rebelling. God, as a just judge, must deal with sin must deal with wrongdoing, must deal with evil. If you go to court and there's a family member that was something terrible happened to them and the, the person that did something terrible to your family member and you're standing there in court and the judge says, well, I'm a judge of love, you just go your way. That wouldn't be a just judge. That would be wicked, that would be wrong. God is a just judge, he deals with evil and he will deal with evil. Judgment is coming. And biblically speaking, I believe that judgment's gonna come very soon. And I pray not one of you watching, none of you in this room, none of you outside, none of you will be here during this time. You can escape it. You can't stop it. You cannot stop this judgment, but you can escape it through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you've received him as your Lord and Savior. I pray that you've repented of your sin. I pray that he's the Lord of your life. And I pray that you have given yourself over to his lordship because if so, you won't be here. Amen. So here we are and if, I'm gonna ask you to please stand with me and I'm gonna go ahead and read the first seven verses out of Revelation 16. And John the apostle writes, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went out, excuse me, went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their 
just do. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. judgments. Lord, we pray over these seven verses and we, we ask again for application. We ask, Lord, that you give us understanding of the text that's before us. Teach us, Lord. May we learn of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks. Again, these are God's final judgments. These are known as the seven bold judgments. Here, we're looking at the first part of them. Someone has said that God writes history and he doesn't need an eraser because God never makes a mistake. And it's true. God doesn't need an eraser. What we're reading here, again, it's not something that we can pray away and say, oh, I hope this never happens. No, it's gonna happen, but again, you can escape it. There's a lot of preachers that will not touch chapters, this chapter, chapter 16. There's local churches that I'm aware of that they won't touch this because of how brutal it is, the reality. But the Bible tells me in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture Again, God doesn't need an eraser. This is something that God has preordained and it's a righteous judgment. It's a good judgment and everybody, anybody can escape it. All you need to do is put your trust in Jesus and repent of your sin and accept him as your savior. You don't have to be here. So these are things that will happen in the future that will not happen to you if you've given your life to Christ. But I believe it can do something for all of us as believers. Hopefully it sobers us up to realize I want to live a life for God for eternity. I want to live for him. And when I read things like this, I'm like, oh, Lord, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. We had six kids in our family, and that's, you know, back when spanking was, you know, for, wasn't a problem, you know, so. (laughs) But when one of my siblings would get a spanking in the other room, I would think, oh, I'm going to be a good kid today. I'm going to be, because I was like, I don't want that. And it was deserved or it was something they did that was wrong. And so, and I, I think when I read this, I, I see the same thing. It's like, whoa, 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 God, I, I don't want any of that. I don't want any part of that. You see, the God I know is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of kindness, a God of gentleness, one that's very patient with me. And he's all these things, but yet he's still holy. And in his holiness, he has to deal with sin. He has to deal with wickedness. He's a just God. But we can know him as this just God that loves us or we can rebel against him and we can experience the wrath that he has. He will pour out his wrath. And that's what we're reading here. His wrath being poured out, it's a, again, it's a very sobering chapter. But if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ or you're living in sin and you think you're okay because you're practicing sin and you think God's just smiling on you, let me tell you this. God doesn't smile on sin. He hates it. He wants to deliver you. He wants to set you free from it. Turn to him today. Repent of your sin. Make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior. Don't play games right now. I don't believe we're living in a time where you should be playing games. A way of reminder as we look through this terrible text of devastation that's gonna take place, we as a church, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, you will not, we will not be here during the time of tribulation. We won't be here because we will be where? Heaven. In heaven. That's my eschatology, that's my understanding. You might differ with me, but that's okay. That's not a salvation issue. Uh, I sleep better with my theology, actually, so. <laughs> Much better. Another reminder before we dive into verse 1, I love to remind everyone of this, especially if it's your first time here. The book of Revelation is the only book in the entire Bible that promises a threefold blessing. We are blessed when we read it, we're blessed when we hear it, and we're blessed when we apply it. We just read it, we just heard it. There's the twofold blessing. Let's see what we can do with application. Let's see if we can... Bring some application here and apply it to us. So verse one, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out 
the bulls of the wrath of God on the earth. The loud voice from the temple. If you're a note taker, the, the word loud, the Greek word is uh, megas. It's where we get our, our word megaphone or mega, great. So it, it means great. It means loud. It means awesome, powerful. 84 times uh, it's used in the book of Revelation, this word. 11 times right here in this chapter. It's a loud voice from the temple. Whose voice is this? I believe it's God speaking. And you might say, well, pastor, why do you believe it's God speaking? Thank you for asking. That's a good question, by the way. (laughs) Well, check this out. Remember in chapter 15, it says, the temple, that's where the voice comes from, was filled with the smoke from the glory of God, right? And from his power. And no one was able to enter what? The temple, no one's able to go in till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Are they, are they completed? No. So the voice needs to be God. This is God speaking in a loud voice to these angels. I want to use this to remind us God desires to speak to you if you're a child of God. One of the primary ways God speaks to us is what we're doing right now is through the word of God. I pray he speaks to you today. God desires to speak to us, but he speaks to us in different ways. Jesus said, John 10, 27, he says, my sheep do what? Hear my voice, and I know them. That's personal. I hope you have a personal relationship with him, because if so, you'll hear his voice. And they do what? And they follow me. That's Jesus. He, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And God, again, speaks to us in different ways. Another way God speaks to us, I believe in a still small voice. And he desires to speak to us. Have you ever had God speak to you in a still small voice? Isn't it awesome? You're like, that was God. Remember the prophet Elijah Remember, he was used mightily to expose the false prophets of Baal. Remember, 450 of them were executed because they were wicked, they were evil, and he had them all executed, remember? And then one lady, remember her name? There you go, Jezebel. Jezebel says, I'm going to kill that man. And this strong, mighty warrior for God ran for his life. Do you know that? And he hid out in the wilderness and he started telling God, you know, God, take my life. This is terrible. And he said, you know, they're, they're, they've, there's nobody else but me left. And he's crying. Remember that? And he goes, he finally ends up in a cave. He was isolating, by the way. Oh, did I say that on Facebook? <laughs> he was. He was isolating himself by himself. God doesn't like when you do that. And he, he said, God said to him, What did he say? Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Get out of the cave. He calls him out. He says, stand on the mountain before the Lord. So he's out there. He's standing there. And it says, behold, the Lord passed by. So don't miss this picture. He's hiding. He's afraid. He's uh, he's worried Jezebel's going to find him and kill him. And so he's all afraid and all this stuff. He's hiding in a cave. He's like uh, having a pity party. Take me, Lord. I don't want to live anymore. Oh, just this woe is me. And God says, get up. Stop complaining. Get out. Stand on the mountain before me. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke what? The rocks in pieces. Is that an awesome sight? I think he's trying to get his attention. (laughs) Don't lose the picture. He's isolated. He's by himself. He's afraid. God says, get up. Stand on the mountain. And then... The Lord passes by and there's, there's rocks and all, all around and he just, God comes by and goes, Poosh, and starts getting his attention. And a strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But what does it say? But the Lord was? He wasn't in that wind. And after the wind, there was a, can we say it together? Earthquake. There's an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the Earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. All the things that made a lot of noise and all these things making, you know, big hoopla, distraction, big, but God wasn't in any of that. And after the fire, a still small voice. 
And the Lord spoke to him out of his still small voice and spoke to Elijah, gave him his marching orders. God wants to speak to us. God desires to speak to us. My question is, are your ears open to what God has to say? And I I pray he does speak to us. Way back in 2000, when I was engaged to Kathleen, we went on a missions trip, a mission, excuse me, conference in Austria at the castle. I was courting my wife to be at a castle. It was beautiful. It really was. It was dreamy. It was like, really? Is this happening? But one of the sessions, they had teaching and stuff going on, and there was a gentleman leading the worship, and he was up on stage, and he was a friend of my wife. And as he's leading worship, he kept looking at my wife, and I was like, or my wife to be, we were engaged, right? And I'm like looking, and I'm looking at her, and she looked up at him, and then, and he just, he just kept, you know, looking over at her, and I'm thinking, keep your, dude, keep your eyes on Jesus, you know? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. And I kept trying to worship. I kept closing my eyes. And I look up again. He's, I'm, he's like looking over. And I'm like looking like, what is going on? So I was, just, I was furious. I'm just as jealous and upset. I, I didn't date for five. God asked me to put dating on the altar. So I didn't date for five years. Then I find my wife and you know, didn't even date her, just courting her right now. And all of a sudden, this jealousy stuff I'd never dealt with in for a long time. And it's just surfacing. And I'm just like, I couldn't wait. Let me tell you something. The, the teaching, I can't tell you anything about the teaching because I couldn't pay attention. <laughs> and right after, I just, I looked at her and I said, what was that all about? And she's like, what are you? <laughs> and she's like, what? And I go, you know what? <laughs> and she's like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And so I explained to her what was going on. I said, you kept looking. He's supposed to be leading worship, and he's supposed to have his eyes on the Lord. And, and then, and so I'm, I'm going through all this, and I didn't even realize, you know, because they were friends, and he's a married man, and he's a, he's a friend of mine today. He's a, nothing like that was even close. He, I, possibly, because my wife is such a great singer, and he was probably just looking to make sure, you know, am I doing okay kind of a thing. But, but see, I, was, I couldn't see any of that. All I saw, I was jealous. And it wasn't founded, it wasn't true, it wasn't real. And as I was getting upset and, you know, she was crying and then she, with tears in her eyes, she said something to me that broke me. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and she says, please don't leave me. And I never experienced that kind of love in my life, ever. Ever. And it broke me. And I said, what are you talking about leave you? I would would never leave you. And the Lord spoke to me in a still, small voice and said, repent, I want to deliver you from this ugliness. And I can stand here and tell you, he delivered me from that. God speaks to us today, even today, in a still, small voice. Sometimes he'll speak to us through other people. He wants to speak to us. He'll speak to us in a still, small voice. He'll speak to us through his word. But are you open to hearing as God speaks through another person? Sometimes he'll do that. A friend of mine, real good friend of mine, I miss him dearly. He passed away about a year and a half ago. And he called me up before he passed away, about a few weeks before he died. He had cancer and loved the Lord. And I had lunch with him and we're sitting there eating lunch and he's just telling me just what's going on in his life. And all I can tell you, the best way I can explain it to you, is when I was sitting there, I felt as if God was just speaking right to me. The Holy Spirit was just speaking All he was doing was telling me, he wasn't saying God this, God this, the Bible that. He was just talking and all of a sudden something happened because he was so filled with the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit was just talking right to me, directly to my heart. And after that happened, I I realized, I I thought, God, I want to be that person. I I want to be a person that God, you can use to speak to other people. I want to be one that's overflowing with your spirit in such a way that people can hear not what I have to say, but people can hear you speak, Lord. You see, God still speaks today. And as I met with this man, he, he spoke to me through this man that's in heaven now. He spoke to me loud and clear. In our text, the voice of the Lord is loud, it's clear. 
There's no confusion. It's very, very clear. He speaks to the seven, and he tells them, now's the time. Pour out my wrath. They've rejected me and rejected me, and now this is the time for my wrath. The first went and poured out his bowl and poured it out, excuse me, poured out his bowl on the, can we say that together? On the earth. So the first bowl pours it out on the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who, can we say that, worshipped his image. So the first bowl judgment affects the health of those on the earth, not just those on the earth. These are all those that are in alliance with the Antichrist, those that take the mark, those that worship the beast, those that are followers of the Antichrist and not following God. These loathsome sores, they're, if you look at these words, they're very painful sores. Most likely they're open sores, boils and, or ulcers, open ulcers, bleeding ulcers. They're incurable. They will not cure from this. There's, there's no, nothing they can take to stop it. They cause severe pain, constant pain, if you look at these words. Possibly, they even have an offensive smell to them, these open sores. It makes me think of sin. Sin, there's no cure for sin except through Jesus Christ. Sin stinks, it smells. And sin cause a lot, causes a lot of pain if it's not repented of. And see, they have this, these that follow the Antichrist have the markings of the Antichrist. Even though the Antichrist is still on the earth, this false Messiah, he has no power to heal any of them. He can't heal them. Why? He's a false Messiah. They, they would go to the doctors. This is going to happen. This is reality. Those that have these sores all over their bodies, they're in severe pain. The stench is terrible. They're going to go to their doctors. They're going to go to the hospital. And guess what? Those that are in the hospital, the doctors will have all these soars upon them if they're followers of the Antichrist. It's an ugly scene. You don't want to be here. In reading commentaries, there's different things that people, different men of God, say that possibly what these can be. If you look at this, it's possible that it was caused, these sores are caused by the mark itself. Some say possibly it's caused by a DNA manipulation gone wrong. Because there's a DNA thing mixed in with this whole thing, possibly. Speculation, don't know. Some suggest that it's caused by a nuclear fallout because of maybe there'll be a massive nuclear war worldwide and so this, these sores come uh, from the fallout. Possibly it's a suggestion, could very well be. Others suggest that maybe because uh, they can't buy or sell without this mark. It's going to be in their right hand or their forehead. Some think that maybe it's a, a chip, a computer chip, and so maybe the computer chips malfunction. Some even suggest when the battery that's in it, if there's a battery in it, if that goes out, it can cause severe kind of sores. Who knows? We're, we're speculating. Guess what? We won't be here, guys. All we know for sure is it will affect a very precious thing, which is health. And I believe we had a little foretaste of that here just recently. I want to point out before we go to the next verse the fact that God provides warning after warning after warning. God doesn't just attack and allow this to happen without repetitive warnings. Remember, they had the, the uh, 144,000 preach the gospel to them. They rejected it. They had the two witnesses on the earth preach the gospel. They rejected it. They had the three angels fly around the whole earth proclaiming the gospel, telling them, don't take the mark. They reject it. For application, I believe even as believers in Jesus Christ, there's going to be warnings God's going to provide escapes for us with, when it comes to sin. And, and it's very important that we take heed to the warnings. Even though we won't be part of this judgment, if we as believers choose to sin after God warns us and warns us, there's going to be consequence for sin in our lives. We have to heed the warnings. Amen? Amen. Some years ago, a while back now, but someone left me a voicemail and and they were just like giving me the, the what for on the voicemail and you know, accusing me of this and that. And it was just, it wasn't even close. It wasn't even, I'm like, really? But 
just the anger and everything that, and the voicemail was just so bad and so vile. So I couldn't wait to call that person. I got my phone and my, and I had my cell phone. I'm like, and I'm going to give them the what for now. I'm going to tell them you're wrong and this isn't. So I'm dialing the number like this and, and it, it rings and it drops the call. And I'm like, no, no, no. So I dial it again and it rings and, and it drops the call again. And, and I'm like, God, is this an escape? Is this a warning? So I called it again. No, no, I don't. No, no, okay. <laughs> no I stopped. And it was a good thing that I did stop. Because if I would have not taken heed to the warning, I probably would have said something I would have regretted. I would have, you know, got upset and would have had to, you know, apologize and repent. And, but God stopped me from that. Listen, God will give us warnings. He'll give us an escape. And I, I just want to encourage you, take the escape. Take the warning. When God is warning you, stop. These guys were warned time and time and time again. They're going to experience the wrath of God. We will never experience, as a born-again, blood-bought saint of the living God, we'll never experience the wrath of God, but we will experience, listen, don't miss this, please don't miss this, you will experience the consequences for your sin if you don't take heed to the warnings. Someone was telling me how they had this friend of theirs that was always making excuses for things in their lives and he, he mentioned that one time they had a meeting and the person was very, very late. They finally showed up and, and then they showed up as a Christian and both of them were Christians and, he, and the guy said, you know, where were you? You know, you're, you're so late. He goes, oh, spiritual warfare. And he goes, spiritual warfare? What happened? He goes, I ran out of gas. And he says, uh, do you have a gas gauge? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it on empty? Does it work? Yeah, it works. And um, is there a light that showed up maybe? Yeah, even the light showed up and that's not warfare. <laughs> there was a warning right in front of you. Stop. Get some fuel. And the same thing with the Lord. We, we, there's warnings that go out. Just don't do that. Stop. Go this way. Why? Because he loves you. Why? Because he knows what's best for you. What does Paul the Apostle tell us? You, you guys know this very well. Paul the Apostle tells us, 1 Corinthians 1013, no temptation, no temptation has overtaken you except, except such that is what? Common to man. We all experience temptation. You're never going to, to the day you die, you're going to experience temptation. Temptation is not sin. It's what you do with that temptation. It can become sin. Some people get all, you know, messed up because they're tempted. No, 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 no. Temptation is not the sin. It's what you do with that temptation. If you follow through with the temptation, it can become sin. But if you resist the temptation, you seek the Lord, it doesn't have to become sin. Everyone has experienced that. All of us as believers. It's, it's common to man. We're all going to have temptations. But God, who is faithful? God is faithful. Don't you love that? It doesn't say, but you are faithful. It doesn't say that. It says, God is faithful. What is he faithful in doing? He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. In other words, it's not going to be, you hear some people say, oh, pastor, you don't understand what I'm dealing with. It's just beyond anything you've ever experienced. Well, the Bible says that he won't give you, allow the temptation to be beyond what you're able. Don't listen to that lie. Don't be under that lie. God is greater than any temptation that comes your way. And he's able to, to keep it, he's got the, the hand on the dial. And th listen to this though, but with the, can we say that together? Temptation. will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Take the escape, run. Don't wait. I've done this both ways. I've, there's been times when I've saw the escape, I ran. Let me tell you, every time that there, there's a temptation that's terrible, that's, that's overwhelming, when I find that escape and I run, it turns out beautifully. Matter of fact, you know you're blessed by that? God blesses you when you resist temptation? Think of Joseph. He ran. He was tempted. He ran out, even without his robe, remember? It's like, whoa, I'm out of here. And then it got blamed on him anyhow. But the blessing, he became second in command of the known world. Take the escape. We'll all be tempted. 
but take the escape. These, in our text, the ones we're reading about, they were warned, they were warned, and they were warned over and over and over again. And, and now we're reading about the consequences because they didn't take heed to the warning. Next plague. The second angel poured out his bowl on the, can we say that together, please? And it became blood, the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every, don't miss this, every living creature in the sea, can we say that? That's heavy. Remember in chapter 8, we looked at the trumpet judgments? Do you remember a third of the sea became blood and a third of the sea creatures died? That's when, when I introduced this whole study here. I said, it's only going to get worse. See, that was a partial judgment. The, a third of the sea was wiped out, but now it's the complete judgment. God's not holding back at this time. Can you imagine the stench that it's going to cause? All the whales... The sharks, the dolphins, the octopus, the stingrays, they're all going to come washing up on shore. The stench is going to be unbelievable. This property here with all the sea creatures, you wouldn't even want to be here. Thank you. We're not going to be here. Amen? Amen. Beachfront property is not going to be desired at that time. Everyone's going to want to live inland. <laughs> Seriously, all those homes out there? Buy some real estate inland because they're going up. <laughs> if, you're not, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, that is. <laughs> 70 percent of the Earth's surface is the ocean. I'm told that the ocean provides at least 70 percent of the world's oxygen through the plant life, the marine plants. It's a great source of oxygen that will be destroyed, depleted in this plague. As we look at all this devastation, I, I want to sh share an article. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Some good news in the midst of all this bad news. How many saw this? Cal Thompson, uh, Mississippi case could help overturn Roe versus Wade, finally. That's yeah, let's give the Lord a hand. Su Supreme Court, this fall, we'll hear a case for, um, from Mississippi. Uh, this was just put out the 5th, June 5th. So this case, keep this in prayer. This could very well, hopefully, uh, overturn this Roe versus Wade nonsense that's killing babies day by day by the millions. So good news. How about this? How many saw this? The, did you guys see this? Bald eagle, this is uh, the Daily Wire. Bald eagles attack Idaho farm, killing 54 sheep. It's just unheard of. A pair of bald eagles are reportedly attacking a flock of sheep as an uh, Idaho farmer said that there's at least, there's, uh, thus far, 54 of his animals have been killed. So there's a lot of strange things going on. One more news article before we go back in our text. Did you guys hear this? Someone text this to me. This is so good. Did you guys hear this, Fox News? California County cuts COVID-19 death toll 25% after finding some deaths clearly not caused by the virus. Amazing. Amazing. No, we didn't see that coming, did we? Wow. I think we've been saying that for a long time. So back in our text. Then a third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and on the springs of water, and they became, can we say that together, please? Blood. And I heard the angel of the, of the waters. Isn't that cool? The angel of the waters. Not an angel of the waters. There's only one. The angel of the waters. God has an angel watching over all of our waters. What is he saying about this? says, you are righteous, Lord. In other words, right on, God. The one who is and who was and who is to be because you have judged these things. In other words, it's, he's saying about time. About time, Lord. Sometimes I get that way. It's about time. So when is justice going to come? When are you going to make things right, Lord? Well, we're reading about it. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. So these are the ones that killed the tribulation saints. They have 
Notice they have shed the blood of the saints, the ones that are getting uh, this poured out on, the ones that have to drink blood for water. This is going to contaminate all the water supply. That's why we know Jesus Christ will come in the second coming very soon because you can't live very long without a water supply. All the water supply, the fresh water will be contaminated. So they said, you have given them blood to drink for it is their just due because they were killing during the time of the tribulation. Tribulation saints, they're, they're, the, the Bible tells us they're innumerable that are going to come to Christ. That means it's going to be a bloodbath. They're going to kill all the tribu- If you think that you can make it through the tribulation period, if you're not a Christian today and the rapture comes, you'll be left behind. You'll have to be beheaded for your faith. You, along with many others, that's why you don't want to be here. So God's saying, okay, you guys like killing, you like blood, I'm going to give you blood to drink. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your, what? So fresh water supply is wiped out. Interesting, God's judgments and punishments fit the crime. They poured out blood. He says, you guys drink blood. How about with, you think of Pharaoh. Remember when Pharaoh was during the time of Moses? Remember he made a law that all the Hebrew boys would be killed? How were they killed? Do you guys remember? They were drowned in the Nile River. Remember that? But Moses was beautiful, remember? So they, they hid him for three months and, and then remember they took Moses and they, they put him there in the Nile River in a little ark and then uh, Pharaoh's daughter saw the little beautiful baby and then the sister was there. Remember the sister was like, oh, isn't he cute? Do you want, I can find someone to nurse him for you. And, and so then Pharaoh's daughter raised this child, Moses, right? But all the babies were killed. They were drowned in the Nile River, right? How did Pharaoh die? He was drowned with his army in the Red Sea. He was drowning babies, so he drowned. How about Haman? Remember what Haman did with Mordecai? Mordecai was an innocent man, a godly man. Haman couldn't stand him. Haman was jealous of him, right? So what did he do? Haman built the gallows, put, you know, to have Mordecai hung on the gallows, right? What happened to Haman? He hung on the gallows that he put up for an innocent man to die. I fear for those that are in the industry of killing babies if they don't repent because they crush their heads, these innocent little babies. I pray for repentance. If you've had an abortion here and you've gone to Christ, God forgives all sin. But with today's science, they should not be crushing babies' heads when we know there's life there and they feel it. Don't tell me that they don't feel it. They feel pain. Remember the movie Unplanned when the probe went in? That's why the lady ended up giving her life to Christ. The probe went in, the baby was moving like this. And she said, what ha- why is the baby moving? Said, the doctor says, oh, that happens all the time. Lord, I pray there's repentance. And I pray we as people do not put one person in office that's okay with crushing babies' heads. His judgments and his punishment fit the crime. They spill innocent blood and, and God says, I'll give you blood to drink. And he contaminates the water supply. Paul the Apostle tells us, Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. I believe there's a lot of people that are deceived these days. A lot of people are deceived. When they take me off of YouTube because I talk truth, and because I give my opinion, and they take me off, that's ridiculous. We're still in America. We should be able to give our own opinions. If you don't like it, turn it off. Go to another station. A lot of people today are being deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also what? Reap. Reap. For he who sows to the, or his flesh, will of the flesh reap what? Corruption. 
Very simple. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary. I didn't want to leave this part out. But let us not grow weary while doing what? Good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Right now we're sowing to the Spirit. Do you know this benefits us for all eternity, what we're doing right now? Just spending time in the Word, sowing to the Spirit. If you sow to the flesh, Paul the Apostle is telling you, don't be deceived. Don't think something good is going to come out of you practicing sin, thinking that, oh, God knows and God's okay with this. No, he's not. He wants to set you free. There is no sin greater than him. There's no temptation that you're dealing with that all of us deal with. We all deal with a common sin. And God wants to give you victory in that area of your life. All you need to do is turn to him. If you reap to the flesh, you're going to sow corruption. If you reap to the spirit, you are going to, excuse me, if you sow to the spirit, you will reap everlasting life. You're going to reap good things. But my exhortation at the end here, guys, you that are doing things that are right, don't grow weary in doing good. Sometimes we don't see immediate results in what we do. Sometimes you ever minister and think, am I even a affecting anything is anything even happening and the the exhortation to you the exhortation to me is that in due season you'll reap just don't lose heart just keep doing what god has called you to do trust that god sees everything he knows what you're doing don't lose heart heavy stuff huh As most of you know, when this whole COVID thing hit the world, my wife and I, we flew to Israel, and then they shut down the planes, and so we went early, as we always like to do, get acclimated, because I don't fly very well, so we're there waiting and for the, our tour to show up, but then the tour got shut down, and all that happened, and, and so it, it was probably the best trip. I mean, I feel terrible for everybody else, but it's probably the best trip I've had in my whole entire life. <laughs> I mean, we had the Sea of Galilee to ourselves on a boat. I mean, everything. It was just like, this was so good. It was, I mean, it was beautiful. But I remember before this even hit, before it didn't hit the news, my wife, she went out and she went to a, a woman's clothes store and she bought a pair of white pants for Israel or whatever. So she, you know my wife, she, if she doesn't get a deal, she's not going to buy it. So she got a great deal. No doubt about that. But listen to this. She brings it up to the counter to check out. And the, the young gentleman behind the counter goes to put it, her white pants in this old, beat-up, dirty plastic bag. And he goes to put it in. She goes, what are you doing? He goes, oh, that's our, pro- we've got a new program here. It's to save the planet and all this stuff. And she says, what are you talking about? She says, well, this is, you, you can turn in your used, your used bags and you get a discount or something like that. And, and she, he's like, would you like me to get you another bag? She goes, yeah, a new one, please. And then my wife said something, because some, he was saying, you know, it's, well, it's all about saving the planet. And then my wife said something like, God is going to incinerate the planet. <laughs> and then she did it in the nicest way, if you know my wife. She said, I understand. She goes, no, we, we're, you know, with, with the environment, we're to, you know, take care of the environment and everything that, thing that. But according to the Bible, God is going to incinerate the planet. And he's just like, with his eyes, just went like this. <laughs> And he looked at me like this. I said, yeah, she's right. I said, God is going to incinerate the planet. I said, but, and then he's looking at me like, and I go, but you can escape it through Jesus Christ. And then he's like backing up like, these guys are from Mars, you know? (laughs) And he says, well, hopefully it won't happen during my day. And I says, well, the way things are going, it might happen during your day. So you need Jesus. And we did our best to, to love on the guy and, and, you know, but the whole thing. This is a reality, though. You talk about global warming? Wait till next week what we're going to look at. We're going to look at global warming next week. <laughs> Biblically, what it looks like. Okay. As we close, his judgment is coming. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I pray this message encourages you to live for eternity. 
I don't want to be a part of that judgment. I don't want anything to do with it, but I don't want my worst enemy to be a part of that judgment. And I'll tell you this with all sincerity. If you've not given your life to Christ, if you do not give your life to Christ, you will have to go through, if the tribulation period happens in our time, which I believe it probably will, all hell will break out on this earth. You don't want to be here. And the only escape is through his son, Jesus. You see, God's wrath will be poured out. He has to deal with sin and wickedness. His wrath is poured out on the cross. Jesus paid our penalty. All you need to do is believe that, repent of your sin, receive him into your life, and you will escape this. If you don't, the warning goes out. Please turn. Please repent. Don't go in the direction you're going in because you might miss the rapture of the church. And the rapture of the church is going to be a day when we who are believers were caught up together with the Lord in the air. And when we're gone, God is going to pour out his wrath upon a Christ rejected world. You don't want to be here. Pray today. Receive him today. Today is the day of salvation for you. Call out to God. Accept his free sacrifice, his love through his son, Jesus Christ, who took the penalty. Do you ever think of the fact Jesus Christ did nothing wrong? The only man that ever walked the earth that never sinned, but yet he was brutally beaten. The Bible says through Isaiah the prophet, he was so badly beaten that he was unrecognizable as a man. They scourged him. They beat him to a pulp. And then they nailed him to the cross. And you might say, why did he go through such a horrific death? The answer is, he died for you because he loves you. Because sin is so ugly. Death must take place. The wages of sin is death. That's why he died for you. He died in your place. He wants to forgive you of your sin if you'll recognize the fact that you are a sinner. You need to repent of your sin. You need to call out to him today and ask him to be your Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sin and to fill you with his Holy Spirit and give you new life. Today is the day of salvation for you. Let's pray.